<clears throat> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank You for this day of life. Uh, Father, thank You for all Your blessings, Your watch care over us, Your grace and Your mercy. Father, the health of our nation is is on the front burner, and I pray that You'd help us, give us the wisdom and knowledge that we need to improve the health of our people. And Father, I pray that You'd help us continue our funding process. There's a lot of hurt in the world today, Father. Those in Myanmar, that, uh, the families that's lost all those children, the China uh, earthquake, and closer to home, those that were injured in the recent tornadoes. And knowing that you know all of this, Father, I pray for those families. I pray that you would uh, give them the grace and, the, and, and comfort that only you can provide. Go with us through this meeting this morning, this health committee meeting. And give us wisdom and knowledge and help us do the very best we can for our people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> the roll call, please signify that you are actually here. And your name is called. Brad Koff. Honey. Janelle Fulbright. Buell England. Here. Bill John Baker. Jack Baker. Here. Hartley Buzzer. Here. Julia Cope. Joe Crittenden. Here. Jody Fishenhawk. Meredith Fraley. Here. Don Garvin. Right. Tiny Glory Jordan. Curtis Snell. Chris Soap. Present. David Thornton. Present. Sarah Cowan Watt. Honey. Chuck Hoskin. Here, but not in. But uh, we have approval of the April 15th minutes, which I believe are in your packets. I need it. We have a motion to approve and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Minutes are approved. And next on the agenda is reports. And from the Claremore Service Unit, we have Marty Smith. You are up. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, probably, uh, I was looking at my report, and I should probably update you also on the selection of the CEO uh, for Claremore. Uh, as you know, it closed on the advertisement closed on May the 5th, and um, I guess the HR people in Oklahoma City will be assembling a panel of applicants, and then I believe on May the 22nd, the uh, advisory board, the tribal advisory board, uh, will be meeting um, at Claremore to um, uh, review applications along with the HR representative from Oklahoma City. So that's kind of where we're at in the process with that. Um, did anyone have any questions about uh, how that's being handled or anything? Okay. Um, I'll move on then to um, some of the other issues like the OB plan. Uh, recently, um, we met with the executive leadership group in Oklahoma City, I believe it was on April the 21st, and um, they felt like that we progressed enough with the um, remodel, renovation of the rooms, LDRP rooms, and, and some of the other issues surrounding the uh, OB service that uh, we're going to begin uh, recruiting for a chief of service uh, for OB and uh, probably a midwife also. Uh, so you should see those advertisements uh, uh, on the street pretty soon. Um, we we're currently are taking patients uh, when they come to deliver. We're letting them see what the rooms are going to look like. And we plan on having a benefits coordinator uh, handing out the uh, patient pamphlets uh, relatively soon and, and located in that area. Uh, right now the benefits coordinator is not conveniently located for the patients. Um, on the CT machine, um, we, I met with Dr. Ferris and, and um, our radiology director and I think we're all um, we're going to make some adjustments to the document that, that I submitted on estimates uh, in terms of um, um, the cost saving, you know, cost, lease costs and then cost savings from uh, CHS dollars. And, uh, but I think we're, 
uh, at a point that we'll be able to go ahead and proceed now with uh, uh, getting the new CT, which will be nice uh, to have that. And uh, we recently, um, Travis and Dr. Motley, one of the, one of the things, uh, I'll kind of blend a couple of things here. Um, we <coughs> talked about some different uh, ways to try to uh, improve the patient flow in the walk-in clinic. We have a, a lot of patient complaints considering the, uh, concerning the walk-in clinic. I'm sure you, you all hear a few of those also. And uh, we're trying to improve the patient flow. And one of the things that um, uh, they've done is to kind of expedite the process. Uh, patients that have a, a contract health referral request instead of having when they need the request renewed instead of coming and sitting in the walk-in clinic uh, for uh, hours to, to get it renewed, they'll be able to work kind of uh, some of those that we're allowed to do that with. Um, we'll kind of like bundle them so that, in other words, um, once the patient gets the initial referral, uh, we won't require them to come and sit through the walk-in clinic and, and wait to get the second one signed and the third one signed. I mean, there are some limitations on that, like when they exceed 90 days and that type of thing, but it, it should also free up some slots in the walk-in clinic so that and you just a handful a day, but, you know, five to seven slots, something like that, to where uh, it won't be clogging the pipe, so to speak, because those patients also clog up the system for other patients that could be seen. Um, our pharmacy residency program was recently reaccredited um, by the American Society of Health System Pharmacists, and our uh, residency director is Ryan Shubaugh. I didn't put that in there, but... Ryan was a resident at, at Claremore himself a few years ago, so he's well trained and does an, does an excellent job. Um, we have a new HR person, uh, Quinn Proctor, and she, she will act uh, as an HR assistant. And one thing that I'm, I'm glad and I'm sure that your people will be glad that Quinn is there because one thing I can assure you that Quinn will be nice to people when they come to um, apply for a job. She'll be friendly and always smiling. And Quinn's just got that type of personality. She came from, she's been a pharmacy technician for years, so she's familiar with uh, uh, a lot of the people in the facility and everything. I want to talk a little bit about our outpatient visits, or our visits in general, as you, as you see. Um, uh, are still down because of our staffing levels. Uh, we, we have had several people express interest recently in working at Claremore, and I'm not sure which ones. I think Dr. Motley has a site visit arranged for two, two doctor, or a doctor and a nurse practitioner. Nurse midwife. Nurse midwife, okay. And, um, but having said that, uh, April's visits were, were not down much. They were from last year. You know, hopefully we'll get them uh, back on the trend of going back up, which is what we're uh, shooting for. Um, as you can see, the new charts were up fairly significantly uh, in April. And the other thing that, the, the good thing uh, uh, is that we, um, once again, the, the coders, the providers, the coders, the billing department, they're all doing a really good job of um, I think our visits are being documented more cleanly, probably as a result of the electronic health record, um, so that uh, what we are billing for, we're collecting over 75% uh, collections over what's billed, which I think is a, probably a pretty good ratio. And collections were actually up uh, 691,000 uh, versus this time last year. Um, our CHS uh, cases, we still have, we uh, submitted um, over $600,000 in CHEF cases that we've not been, been reimbursed for uh, to date. And, um, you know, eventually we will uh, get some reimbursement on that, which we can use the funds for additional patients through the CHS system. And I would say... Um, 
probably, you know, one of our biggest problems right now is our inability to de-obligate funds through the uh, UFMS system. <coughs> and basically what that means is if you, you know, let's, uh, let's say you allocate a certain amount of funds for a contract doctor and they don't use all the funds, well, right now we don't have a good mechanism of de-obligating and recovering those funds. And when you uh, apply that on a facility-wide basis, it's a it's a significant impact. And we've been uh, I just uh, asked Ron Grinnell yesterday. I was <coughs> asking if they had the problem resolved, which of course they don't. But uh, they do know that it's a significant problem, and they're working on it. So. Any questions, Mr. Yes, Mr. Hoskin? Do you have a contract health related question? Um, when a patient goes to a third party facility like an emergency room and they have to notify IHS within a certain time frame, is it sufficient that the, the, the hospital, the third party hospital, notifies IHS, or is it the responsibility of the patient to make sure they've made actual contact? Um, you know, it's my understanding the patient needs to. Is that correct, Dr. Molly? Uh, of course, if anybody does, that would be nice, you know, to where you know. But how is that tracked uh, when uh, the, your facility receives contact, whether it's from a patient or from the third party provider? Um, even if ultimately the claims denied is untimely or denied is other reasons, how is it actually tracked? Um, you know, I'll have to ask Jenny Terrapin uh, that question. We're we're using the uh, our you know the referred care system, but that would probably be on the back side of it. But they may be putting something like that in on the front side. Um, if you want, I can get your information, and after the meeting, I'll ask her and send you the answer to that question. And, and we can discuss this offline, mm -hmm. but I, there was one particular constituent that I recently sent you about. It was, <coughs> there is, it was this very issue with, with whether his third question. party was, was sufficient notice to IHS. And we can talk about that offline. Okay. Um, then another contract health question, when an appeal, when, it, when a claim is denied, an appeal is filed in Oklahoma City, in my area, as you may know, District 9, some of uh, my area is uh, Cherokee Nation contract health and some of it is uh, IHS, uh, particularly South Dockerville uh, is, may, I think even areas of South <coughs> County, but when a person has a claim denied and they file an appeal in Oklahoma City, it, do they ultimately get a response, or if it's if it's further denied, they may not get a response? Because I'm having constituents who filed appeals and they're not hearing anything. And I know that's not your facility, but I wonder well, if you understand the procedure. Yeah, we need to follow up on that. So I just need to kind of, um, I mean, my answer would be hopefully so. But, you know, um, and, and hopefully when the patient filed the appeal, of course they would include the <coughs> correct mailing address and that sort of thing, but um, we just I just need to get the specific examples and I'll follow up on it for you. See, see I appreciate you. that. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Buzzard. Yeah. <coughs> and, and my question is, is almost like uh, what Councilor Hopkins asked. From what I gather from the uh, patients that, that use a third party, place, they apparently did everything right, from what I understand, what they're telling me. I don't know the whole circumstance. But, uh, <coughs> this person was uh, not in the, uh, the fact that they make the phone call himself, but his family member did, his sister did, actually. And then the hospital actually called uh, the criminal in the hospital, too. And he's still been denied. He's been denied, I think, on two different occasions. Uh, so where do we go from here, Marty? Does he just well, keep appealing it, or, or what? I mean, those are questions that I'm sure all other counselors get every day that people are being denied. You know, the, uh, as I said before, and, and I can honestly say this, the CHS system probably frustrates me as much or more than anybody in this room. Um, and, and Dr. Miley's sitting back there, so hopefully he'll correct me if I say anything wrong. But, um, you know, even though they do notify him, 
it doesn't guarantee payment. You know, it depends on the, the priority of the case and, and that sort of thing. But um, we do, we had one case, you know, it's terrible when you can only uh, recite one case, but we had one case this last month where I thought it was a good example of um, uh, Cherokee Nation and Claremore and Hastings all working together to take care of a patient. And literally, uh, the CHS system, they, they simply, because of the priority system, did, did not, uh, were not a high enough priority to get the care through CHS, but the care was coordinated with uh, Dr. Mobley and, and uh, our uh, <coughs> medical social worker and, and the orthopedic person at Hastings and the patient got the care they needed. And so sometimes, you know, you got to think outside the box with CHS because it's, you know, when you're following their guidelines, it's very frustrating, you know. And, and even though the patient um, notified them in the adequate allocated time frame, it still may not be something that meets the priority. Is, well, is I, I just find it a little bit uh, discouraging and a little bit hard for some of our patients out there. Just, I'm going to tell you just one case. And and I've got a couple more questions for you. But this person had a heart attack and was rushed to a hospital in Delaware County. Obviously, he couldn't make it to another hospital. Uh, to me, that, that, that is one case that looked to me like he'd be paid if all the procedures were followed. But yet he's being denied. And, and uh, to me, this was an emergency situation. So I don't know. There's there's something I think that, uh, that we need to look at as far as our priorities go. And, and maybe I don't understand the priority system but as to what they take for and what they don't. But... You know, the guy owes forty some thousand dollars and doesn't have a job, he can't work, so obviously he can't pay for it, so it's really a predicament that it's put this family in. So well, anyway. Well, you know, any time something like that happens, I would invite you to let me know about it. And, you know, I'm not saying that we will do be able to do it, but I will say that we will look at it and, and see if we did anything or if we could have done anything different you know, or can do anything different. And then I had a, uh, I have two more questions for you. This is a real quick question on third-party billing. Uh, does Claremore Service Unit not pursue the third-party billing as much as we do here in Hastings Hospital? I know the numbers are way, they're, they're really skewed. Well, um, there's several reasons for that. Okay. I've got a better answer for that question, probably. Um, for one thing, um, you know, we geographically are different than Hastings. We're not as isol isolated. And so our patients with insurance have a lot of different choices because of where Claremore is located. Then we, um, you know, based on the percentage of our patients that do have insurance, uh, I'm not sure what it is at Hastings, but I think at our place it probably uh, probably around 30 to 35 percent of the patients have any sort of insurance. Um, and once again, the ones that do have a lot of different opportunities. So we have to be more competitive. Um, but of the visits that we, that are seen at Claremore, uh, one, and another factor is the lower volume of patients. Of the patients that are seen at Claremore, I think they do a pretty good job of of recovering uh, third-party resources. So, so you're pretty satisfied with the I, I, I think... Uh, or, at least, or at least they're getting all their cancer. Yeah, but. I think they're doing a pretty good job. The one area that we recently are looking at, and Travis is helping us look at it, uh, that we maybe have opportunity for improvement would be with our um, uh, pharmacy point of uh, sale uh, software. You know, we have some room for improvement on that. The other question I had is on the deobligation of funds. Uh, when you don't get to deobligate those funds, you don't lose those funds, do you? I hope not. Uh, you know, uh, Ed might uh, have a good answer for that, too, but, you know. Uh, it doesn't sound right. No, I, I think, I think eventually the they'll resolve the issue and we'll pull them back in and be available. But uh, it is a little frustrating to, to not be able to, you know, in the past, uh, you could do a little more manipulation of funds. And then in addition to that, um, you know, UFMS is, I know you've heard this before, but it's like real-time spending. It's like if you're out of money in your checking account, you cannot obligate because it won't allow you. So 
problem. Well, I can understand some of the uh, federal accounting system, but I don't want to do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Kellen Watts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Dr. Smith, I'd like to also kind of answer some of the concerns from the council. Um, this, I think you guys, uh, Councilman Hoskins and Councilman Buzzard, both brought up very real issues that I experience every day as well. And that's why for four years I've been advocating to have Claremore Indian Hospitals <laughs> contact health services brought through to the Cherokee Nation because that would affect many of our districts up north, especially. It's to no offense of the Indian Hospital <laughs> folks and the IHS or the federal employees. It has to do with the difference between the federal regulations and our ability to self-determine and the flexibility that we are given ourselves in order to be more efficient um, and effective with contract health dollars. Um, and that doesn't reflect on the individual employees, but more the difference between the federal system versus the Cherokee Nation system. And, and I guess that's why uh, I'm excited about the move forward with Hastings because I get to see the difference between Cherokee Nation Healthcare providing uh, cert health services versus the hamstring that the federal guidelines puts on federal employees and their inability to serve our Cherokee citizens. And that's the difference between the Indian Health Service and the Cherokee Nation Health Services. So I think our staff is moving forward and continues to try to work with the area office in order to take over the contract health dollars from Claremore Indian Hospital, which would uh, resolve lots of the issues that we see. But I would like to also encourage, um, as the advisory board chair at, at Claremore Indian Hospital, I get the opportunity, and it's in my backyard, <coughs> to understand how to work with that facility and uh, Dr. Mobley, uh, Linda Camerzell, who's the admin that herds all of us cats, is what I tell her. She's very good about no matter who's in the office for vacation or people come have to come in and out, like when Katrina came. She's very, very good about making sure that if it's Dr. Smith or Dr. Mobley, that we get, if there's a concern with the patients, you just have to email or call her and she hands it off to that staff and they'll follow up. Uh, but that's the only way when we're dealing with area office. Um, and she they all coordinate very well with Brett Hayes and Cherokee Nation Health in addressing individual uh, citizens' needs uh, because, unfortunately, because it's a federal agency, it's sometimes very difficult, especially when a patient is hurting because anytime there's health care issues, we almost always have somebody that's hurting and already in pain and having difficulty dealing with the situation. But so far, they've been very good about making my life easier, so I'd encourage... Uh, the tribal council members to, to contact them. I don't know, do you guys have cards on you or Dr. Mobley, do you have? So the T is our patient advocate, is, so to speak, or the liaison or customer service rep sometimes. <laughs> How he's everything, he's wrestled people <laughs> too. So, but he's, he's the one that will make sure that somebody gets their issues addressed. And we serve 13 counties at Claremore Indian Hospital and 17 tribes, or it's 11 counties. No, but it's 17 tribes. 17 tribes, and I think 11 counties uh, are what the funding's based on at Claremore Indian Hospital. So they have a very difficult job um, in addition to those federal regulations. So I think knowing that, I think we can work together better with what we've got. But I am looking forward to the time that the tribe has their contract health services. Thank you for indulging me, Mr. Chair. I have a question. Do you... Um but your statistics, I'd like to know, do you feel that your your collections are obviously up, approaching three quarters of a million dollars, but your emissions, everything's down except your April new charts. <coughs> do you feel that that is a, a lag time and you're going to see a, a drop in your collections and you just haven't caught up with your decreased visits? Or what do you attribute the the increase in your collections to at this point based on well I, I I'd like to think we're at the bottom of our visits I, I really would publicly say I think we are um, if we're not we're we're going to really struggle but I, I think we're this close to turning around the staffing issues and um, and as you can see if you if you increase your staff by 30 percent um, the, the visits would take care of themselves but um, I would to answer your question on the 
uh, collections being up, I really think that um, the, I, I told Travis this the other day. Um, I was talking to someone. I can't remember who I was talking to. Uh, and I said, um, oh, I was John Dougherty. I saw him uh, in the parking lot and, uh, for a moment. But, you know, I was telling him I, I thought we were kind of getting to the point of getting the staffing situation on the upward trend. And um, uh, the... Um, you know, the visits, um, I really believe the one thing I left out uh, of the conversation is I really believe that the electronic medical record, uh, it was a little painful to go through implementing it and deploying it, but I really believe that what uh, the billing people are getting now are better documented visits, and, and so what's going across is we're actually able to collect on before we had a lot of trash. We had a lot going across, but a lot of it was trash, you know, and so, and we kind of have that going on right now with the pharmacy point of sale to some degree, and Travis is taking a look at that, and that's why I made the comment that we have probably an opportunity to improve that and make it more efficient, but that, that would be my answer, uh, is I think our visits are better documented now. <coughs> Just to expand on that, for the counselors that, that aren't familiar with with medical billing, um, you don't realize unless you have people that are very apt at billing medical procedures and electronic billing helps with that, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. And the insurance companies aren't going to come back and go, oh, you missed this, <laughs> because they don't want to pay you. So anyway, are there any more questions for Dr. Smith? Thank you. You're welcome. Next. Hastings, Mr. McElmore. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Good I uh, <clears throat> first want to apologize. We had a little mix-up in our reports that we sent in. The one that was sent in, in earlier and may have been included in your packet is not the one I would be referring to. It's the one that we handed out this morning. Uh, there were some uh, old chart items that had to be uh, adjusted. Uh, some of the numbers we had to update. And so this is a good report that you have in front of you. <clears throat> um, the one thing I would point out uh, as far as recent developments, it's something we've been working on for some time. It's that second bullet on the first page, uh, recent developments. So we have a new audiologist on board. He started last week, I think, or maybe the week before. And uh, he's now getting his equipment calibrated. He's uh, getting situated uh, with so, uh, help from the Cherokee Nation. As far as support staff uh, helping him uh, get situated, he visited Claremore to review some of the uh, waiting lists and backlog information. And we'll be contacting patients, starting with PEDS patients, the pediatrics patients, and others uh, very soon. Uh, mail order pharmacy. I know we've been talking about this for some time, and uh, we've run into some <coughs> uh, some of the administrative uh, issues that uh, Council Member Cowan referred to in the context of her uh, the, her comment was in the context of CHR but we're seeing that also in acquisitions we're having some difficulty getting the postal system paid for the mailing of those pharmacy items uh, out to patients it's becoming more and more pressing for us because of the price of gas and that sort of thing. I mean, we're, we're seeing some uh, d difficulties being experienced by patients uh, who come to Hastings. We see patients from every county in the state of Oklahoma. They come from all over the state of Oklahoma except for the two far western counties, and maybe they just haven't heard about us or something. But, <laughs> or they'd be here. And, you know, people from Kansas, Missouri, Arkansas, even New Mexico and California come to Hastings for certain types of services. And one of those is pharmacy services. 
Um, and so we'd like to be able to start up this mail order system as uh, uh, soon. And we hope to be able to do that because we think we have some solutions worked out for the uh, payment of the postal fees or charges. Uh, Joint Commission, uh, we're up for our three-year review next year in a, about June, but we have to do an annual review uh, <coughs> at about the anniversary time of our last survey, and that's coming up in June. It's uh, what we call the PPR or Periodic Performance Review, and that's where we do a self-assessment of all of the standards of the Joint Commission, about 240 or so standards with multiple components within each standard that we have to meet and uh, we're, we're formulating our uh, documentation to submit for that uh, review. Uh, <clears throat> one announcement in particular I'd like to bring to your attention is the W. WH Governing Board meeting is set for July the 3rd. Uh, we'd be happy to have you there. Uh, it's where the area office comes in and receives reports from our departments uh, about our performance and that sort of thing. And uh, you're welcome to attend. Ambulatory visits, discharges. You'll see a downward trend in our discharges, and that's been the case over the last several years and that's a national trend that people are just not being hospitalized at the rates that they had been previously. There are better uh, <coughs> therapies uh, uh, available for outpatient services uh, and they're just not uh, the needs any longer to have inpatient services. Our typical um, census is around uh, 16 to 19 and we have a 32-bed inpatient component. So we're taking a look at those kinds of trends to see what our um, options may be. Uh, I know Councilman Buzzard a minute ago talked about collections uh, in Claremore. I'd point out here for your benefit, we are slightly ahead of pace this year compared to last. You see the graph at the top of the third page and then the uh, old set of numbers down at the bottom. But right in the middle, you'll see in, uh, highlighted in red that we were at 18.9 million last year at this same time, and we're now at 20.19, roughly 1.27 million ahead of pace last year, uh, where we were last year. We're targeting at this same rate about 34.35 million for this year. Last year we were at about 33.3. .3. So it could be uh, slightly above even that 34 million level. And uh, we've done very well. Uh, that, that's a credit to the folks who were in place uh, several years ago and some of the folks are still here. Keith Barrick and others made decisions uh, to invest in those areas uh, that uh, actually go toward capturing the charges and uh, identifying those uh, <clears throat> uh, cost items that can be billed for. We set in place a number of uh, improvements, charge master, the electronic health record. We see the evaluation and management uh, levels raised one full level in the uh, coding for procedures. Uh, because we're able to better document, as uh, Dr. Cobb mentioned a minute ago, we feel like we're not leaving a whole lot on the table uh, as far as we're able to uh, identify those uh, charges, at least. I mean, it, it's we're not saying we're maxing out our capacity here for billing, but we're getting getting up there. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions for Mr. McElmore? Yes. Councilman. I have one, uh, Mr. McElmore. And uh, I'm going to ask it. 
Are you losing a lot of your staff uh, providers to Paramore or to other other hospitals? <coughs> well, it would appear that we're losing staff, but what we are seeing is that it's not any different from any other time. I mean, we typically have 10 to 12 percent of our positions vacant at any given time. There's always a churning. But within the last few months, we've held off. We've been very judicious about filling positions because of the likelihood of a transition over to the Cherokee Nation in terms of management of the facility. So we've been very cautious about which positions we're filling. Direct service positions, we're being filled across the board. And some of those, now, we, we've lost a few. Uh, we highlight um, Travis as being one of the uh, new folks up at uh, Claremore, and uh, we applaud his choice uh, because he can, I think, help Claremore with some of the things that they're working on, having learned a lot down at Hastings. And so we don't see this as a loss necessarily because uh, we're still providing those services to Indian people within the Cherokee Nation service area. So there are some uh, movements. Some of the physicians have chosen to do so, but it's it, by and large our folks are eager to embrace this uh, transition and uh, are uh, are looking forward to an improved uh, service package. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Callan Watts. Thank you. Uh, and we appreciate at Claremore your staff that you provided because we've had a difficult time <laughs> filling positions, so it's been a blessing on our end uh, from our perspective to serve a different part of the Cherokee Nation. So I don't see it as a bad deal. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for sharing it. <laughs> Are there any more questions for Mr. Macklemore? Thank you. Okay. Next, Chair uh, Health uh, Services, and then oh, just, just to come sorry. Sorry. Uh, It's kind of ironic, yeah. you know, that Kara, Ms. Callan Watts, said that. But <laughs> I'm in the uh, actually I'm in the Claremont Service Unit, but but you know we got Hastings down here for our Cherokee people too. But anyway, I'm supportive of both units. That's uh, <laughs> Actually, I have another question from Councillor Baker. It, it's just an announcement. The uh, for those interested, uh, Stacy Leeds had her baby a few minutes ago, and seven pound, seven and a half pound boy, mm -hmm. and she had some problems and was hospitalized. And, mm -hmm. and um, but anyway, she, the baby's healthy. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Um, I believe next we have Secretary of State Melanie Knight is going to take over for Cherokee Nation Health Services. Thank you, Dr. Cobb. I'm pleased to be here on behalf of Melissa Gower today. She asked uh, Dr. Grimm and I to be here in her stead while she's on leave today. And I believe you all have received a written report from her. And uh, Dr. Grimm is here to answer any questions about that report. Um, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about negotiations and update you all as to where we are and uh, where we're headed with those negotiations on Hastings and then in, um, answer any questions you might have. Um, just to highlight some issues and, and those that are on the council that have been attending have been uh, engrossed in the nitty gritty detail of this, but uh, first of all, uh, their legal counsel was at issue. Um, when we negotiated three years ago, uh, their counsel was at best difficult uh, to deal with, um, arguing over every period, every word, every nuance of the agreement, and it bogged down the negotiations terribly. Uh, we asked the director of IHS um, uh, whether he could rectify that for these negotiations because the size and scale of this <coughs> project. He agreed and he assigned um, different counsel to our negotiations and she showed up last week at the first meeting that she's participated in. Um, her name is Hillary from the Office of General Counsel and um, it's already a breath of fresh air for us in terms of negotiating with her uh, representing the IHS. Uh, second, um, 
and uh, Councillor Watts brought this up is CHS with regard to Claremore. Uh, we've been trying to get information sufficient enough to allow us to make decisions about CHS at Claremore for years. Um, we're getting closer on that information, however, uh, it's not satisfactory in our opinion and so we're still pursuing uh, the financial data on that as well as the workload data on that because we need to know not just uh, how many dollars are associated with it but what's the workload that's going to come with the program and what geographic area are we going to serve as a result of that and so uh, we continue to work on that and we realize CHS at Claremore is, is an issue we have a lot of people being denied and we, we try to help them work through the IHS system as well. So if you have some cases that Brett can help with, um, he's been doing that quite a lot um, in, the CH in CHS at Claremore. Uh, third, uh, the funding agreement itself, uh, where we are with that, uh, we've identified from the nation's perspective what we think uh, needs to change with regard to the funding agreement. By and large, um, not a lot of language changes in my opinion. Um, at the last meeting last week, IHS brought forward their proposals on changes to the funding agreement and we went through again, so we've been through the document twice now, once with our proposals, once with their proposals, identified every section that um, is still unresolved we're still talking about language. Either they've made a proposal and we haven't responded to it yet or vice versa. Um, those sections, um, as we look through those sections, most of them are not substantive, I would say substantive changes or deal killer kinds of uh, sections of language. Um, examples, they want some wording changes to say medically related as attached to services. And I, I think those kinds of additions we're probably not going to have a lot of heartburn with and um, so a lot of those sections deal with that kind of thing. There are some sections that we're going to have more discussion about and I'd like to talk about some of those items before we leave here. Um, one issue that's just to talk about some of the financial issues um, in relation to the negotiations. One of them is contract support costs. It's a big ticket item. Uh, contract support costs is mostly uh, composed of indirect costs as we know it. So our indirect cost pool and how we fund it because that's not something IHS pays but it will be something the nation will pay. Uh, the law says that uh, IHS is supposed to provide contract support costs above and beyond the basic program. So they're supposed to pay for those costs in addition to the program costs. What we know is and what reality is is that appropriations are not there congressionally to fund contract support costs. And so what we've done is in all of our planning is to take the most conservative approach and that is assuming that we get none. Assuming that we get none, uh, how would we make those funds available? How would the budget be constructed? Uh, what is the impact to the indirect cost pool? All of those issues and how are we going to plan for them? Uh, if we were to just take an estimate of what the contract support cost need for Hastings would be, it would be about $4 million and that's just you know, rough estimates, not, um, not you know, real accurate because you don't know what the pass-throughs would be. Um, so what we've looked at is how do we mitigate that $4 million in, in the operation of the Hastings facility. Um, what is unique about uh, the first year of operation is that um, IPA and MOA agreements, which is offers for continued federal employment, will be offered to every employee that's eligible for one. So the ones that we've gone through each section, different type of employee and how many would be eligible and assuming that most of them, which is typically in our, um, in our experience with other huge hospital asso assumptions, most of them that are eligible for IPA MYs take them. And so we estimate about 183 out of 576 staff would become tribal hires uh, as a result of uh, an assumption, which means most of them, all of the Commission Corps typically take an MOA agreement. Uh, many of the civil service, most of the permanent ones will also take uh, an IPA agreement. And so we estimate about 183 that are temporaries and then also that don't accept federal employment would be tribal hires. 
So what that does for us is gives us uh, a basis for which to do mock-up budgets. And we've been doing those projections, been doing those performers years out um, because for IPA and MOA costs, we pay the federal government, the federal government pays the employee. And so when we do that, we pass those costs through and we do not charge indirect costs to them. We don't charge indirect costs to those drugs and pharmaceuticals that we buy uh, in our clinic uh, setting. So we'll also pass through drugs and pharmaceuticals out of Hastings. So those won't be charged indirect costs. So we start you know, doing all of those calculations and doing those mock-ups to see what our actual contract support costs need in year one will be. And that estimate is um, about $2 million. Another thing that plays into this is this. Um, that <coughs> built into the direct budget of ha at Hastings are administrative functions. They have procurement, they have property, they have IT, they have uh, executive direction and so forth. Um, all of those functions, most of them, uh, will be in our indirect cost pool. And so what happens is, is we have to do an analysis of um, how much of those employees, which would, it would probably be 80 to 90 percent of them, would end up being funded in the direct, indirect cost pool and removed from the direct program. So in our setup, we transfer those employees, not physically, but budgetarily into the indirect cost pool. And then um, the indirect cost pool pays for their salaries, which frees up program funds. So as you can see, it's kind of a shifting <coughs> around of when we organize it at the nation where financially those funds would be provided. And so while we estimate the indirect cost need for year one would be about $2 million, we also see that there's about $2.8 million currently being spent on administrative-like functions at Hastings. And so what we want to do is ensure that there's no or very little impact to the indirect cost pool. And so by you know, looking at all of that, we've been able to assure ourselves that there will not be an indirect cost impact for the assumption of the program. So we'll be looking at um, how many of those $2.8 million of administrative functions will be transferred to indirect cost pool. So that's a somewhat about indirect cost. Year one, again, we're planning for receiving no additional dollars, worst case scenario. Uh, what we see though for the long term is that Congress appropriates money every year. It's not sufficient, but it's an increase. We get on the shortfall report, we get a share of that increase, and over the long term, we get funding, and it, and it incrementally increases. Um, it's always short, but we will receive additional funding each year for, in, for indirect costs and contract support costs. So that's just a little bit about contract support costs. It's much more complex than that, but I, I try to want to keep it um, as straightforward as possible so you get the gist of what we're looking at. Um, Secondly, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the general costs of staffing. Um, we've looked at the fringe rates for these federal employees, if they remain federal employees, if they become tribal hires, what is the cost associated with that because, of course, they're different. We have different things in our fringe pool than the feds have in their fringe pool. Uh, the federal fringes are paid some at the local area, local budget. Some of those fringe costs are paid not in the local budget. And so that's part of our task is tracking all of those funds down and making sure the nation gets its share wherever it happens to be uh, that are being paid for those federal employees so that we get a maximum amount of dollars for them. But cost-wise, when we're talking about our budget, um, we compared those fringe rates. Our budgetary fringe rate is 31%. Uh, their budgetary fringe rate, uh, from our analysis, there's each type of employee is charged differently. So they vary from, if you look at uh, their costs, they appear to vary from about 19% to 33, 36%. So on average, we took the total number of employees, averaged it out. It comes out to 24.76% across the board. That's straight fringe. Uh, when we pay for federal employees, uh, there is what's called a full cost recovery rate. And what that is is the administrative burden 
associated with the, the processing of federal employees on, on the IHS side because they'll still be federal employees in the federal system. They'll be charging us, sending us an invoice for those federal employees. So there's costs associated with all those functions. So they charge us for those costs. And that represents right now the full cost recovery fee is 2.19% of all the federal salaries. So that gets added on to you know, our costs for the federal employees. So that comes out to about 27%, just under 27%. So 27 compared to 31 is about 4% uh, or so, you know, give or take probably 1% or 2%, that there'll be a difference in tribal hires <laughs> Tribal hires being higher in cost, which is interesting. You know, everyone assumes that federal employees are more expensive, but uh, tribal hires will be about four or five percent higher in cost than federal employees. So another good reason to encourage as many uh, of the existing federal employees as are eligible to accept federal employment, because it just saves us a little money on top of that. So. Where do we pay for those additional costs? I mean, that could be a question to you because we'll have some additional costs related to those tribal hires. Um, what we have not factored in um, to the initial program budget at this point is tribal shares. <coughs> tribal shares are the administrative dollars at the area office and the headquarters office that the nation gets access to um, whenever a program is assumed and it has to relate to the program and it's only the share related to that program and it's done on a percentage basis. So we've looked at you know those tribal shares, we've looked at um, any retained kind of functions which means what would we leave at IHS at least right off the bat. Uh, one of them being a lot of IT services because that supports what we call the RPMS system that is the patient database that we use at all our clinics that Hastings uses that we would want to continue to use because it feeds data into the national system and it drives budget, you know, it drives appropriations, it drives uh, the GIPRA reports for the federal government, it drives a lot of things. So we want to participate in that. Those kinds of things that we want to retain uh, with the federal government, we've factored in some estimates for those. Um, the full cost recovery fee that I mentioned of 2.19%. Right now, we're trying to negotiate that down because we think it's too high. Um, given that the 2.19% is based on the number of federal employees they, they've got out there right now and the cost of it, administrative costs of supporting them. When we add, who knows, four to 500, I don't know, three to 400 employees into that system from Hastings, then that drives the cost down the percentage of each, each one because the administrative, it's an economies of scale thing. Um, because if we were to just factor the full cost recovery fee right now on our estimates, it would be about $900,000. Well, that's far more than the area is going to spend processing the paperwork for those employees because it's a one-time contract that's renewed every two years and then invoices after that. So it's, it's fairly nominal um, per employee kind of cost. So, but we factored in the entire cost into this estimate, just as, just as a means of doing that. Um, we also added in the fringe differential on, on our hires, the tribal hires. So given all of that, um, there's a, the area has estimated, they've identified about $3.4 million in new funding from the area and headquarters tribal shares at this point. Uh, that's, I would say, lower ball estimate because, again, we're trying to negotiate dental residency program, uh, nursing or pharmacy residency program, some other programs out there that we know the nation should have access to to support the program at Hastings. But, again, we're, we're trying to deal with the most prudent numbers that we can deal with. 3.4 million, uh, we subtract off all those costs for our PMS, for the fringe differential, for the full cost recovery fee. That leaves an estimated 1.5 million above and beyond those costs that are available to plow into additional services that we want to provide at Hastings. Um, and again, just ballpark numbers. We would just want to make sure we can do this in a very responsible way. We want to provide mammography and some other things right off the bat. And in order to be able to do those things, we're going to need to have some money to do those. So um, 
again, that's just a really rough go through of the, you know, the financial planning and what, what, what thought has gone into that. And what I'd like to request um, from the committee is if uh, we could have a small meeting with uh, your CPA and perhaps the treasurer and perhaps the chair of ENF to uh, sit down and go through, you know, drill down to more detail if you'd like to about those projections and the years out and how it changes in year two and year three. Um, we would like to do that so that we can answer all of those questions about financial information. Uh, the next item I'd like to talk a little bit about is information requests. Associated with all of this planning and all of this negotiation, we have, right now we have on the board about 35 pieces of information we've asked the Indian Health Service for. We chart it out, we track it, we try to put deadlines to it, but uh, the Indian Health Service doesn't observe our deadlines very well. Uh, so we've got Right now, 35 items on a list. They responded so far to nine of those, uh, providing the information that we want. Um, we've highlighted four of them as being very critical in terms of timelines because four, those four items deal with staffing issues and or clearances. Uh, for example, we do drug testing, they do not. So. Um, how do we do drug screening in advance of doing any kind of transition? And so we need information from any health service as to whether they can voluntarily subject themselves to drug screening in advance of becoming uh, transitioning to the nation. So those kinds of things, they seem very, they're very detailed, uh, but we need those things answered in order to move forward. And so... May I Yes. Are, are those four critical ones, are they included in the nine that they've submitted? No. Okay. They're in the remaining that are not yet answered. So what we've prepared is a letter to the Director of Indian Health Service. Um, we've been working with the agency lead negotiator who's an area employee who works out of Oklahoma City. Uh, what we've prepared is a letter to the Director in Rockville um, highlighting those high priority areas that we need responses to those pieces of information. Um, a lot of these pieces of information, we can continue with other areas and negotiate, you know, giving them time to respond. These four, we need to address very soon, in the next couple of weeks. And so, we've prepared a letter with those high priority areas of information highlighted um, and that we need to resolve them very, very quickly in order to move forward. We've also um, scheduled conference calls between now and our next meeting. Our next meeting, face-to-face -face meeting, is the week of June 2nd uh, to continue these negotiations. We scheduled conference calls with their negotiation team and the first thing we're talking about is this list of information because um, in order to get a clear picture, again, to negotiate those funds that they haven't identified yet, um, those kinds of things, we need to be able to, to have the information to do that. So. So that, that is critical and we're pursuing that. So I'd be happy to answer any questions that you all might have Council about where we are. Soap is up first. Yeah, actually, uh, Mr. Chairman, I was uh, wanted to ask a question about the report, so if we want to address okay. those first, then I can come back. Okay. Uh, Councilor Jordan is up. Can we have a copy of those questions? The, uh, Informational request. Information request, certainly. Could you provide that to us? In you? fact, um, I've, I believe the letter has been signed and the attachment is the list, <coughs> so I'll provide that to the entire committee. Could you maybe just, if you have it, just let one of the girls copy it for you? Okay. I can get it emailed over. Okay. I don't have the signed one. Okay. And then on the 183 jobs that you think are going to be tribal hired, mm -hmm. have we determined yet whether the jobs and the pay? for those individuals are going to be comparable to what they're receiving now? We have done an initial uh, comparison to fit those job titles, uh, crosswalk them to a job title at the nation, and then look at that range and scale and see how it fits with their current rate of pay. And Gloria, can you speak to what the numbers come out on that? It actually came out much better than we thought. There were really just three big categories of where people fell outside of our range. 
one of them was security guards, and it fell us out of our range. And because we don't really have, a, I think a security guard at the hospital, in my opinion, does a lot different things than a security guard who's doing more of an eight to five, not dealing with patients who sometimes can get upset. So we're going to re we have to redo a job description for that. So we're working with HR on that one. The other category was telephone operators um, that fill, and they weren't much outside of our range. We're talking 50 cent, you know, just minimally outside of our range. Um, so we're working with HR on, on that to try to to try to accommodate that. And then there was what was the third one? Housekeeping. Housekeeping was the other one that fell outside of our range. And so we're working on that. The one thing that we've been waiting on, and we're still waiting on it, is. The HR was supposed to be doing that MAG report to get back with us on where they did an analysis of all the employees at Cherokee Nation and their jobs and if the pay ranges were in the right range. We still haven't got the results of that, but what we think is that we're going to find out for some of those things like housekeeping, telephone operators, that we probably need to increase our range to be more competitive. The goal is, I mean, we want to try not to have to decrease, you know, any employees at Hastings, especially because those are three of the lower paid categories of employees. Um, so we want to try not to de decrease them. One, we think maybe ours are low and we can elevate them. And then two, um, if we can just, because they were just tiny numbers, I mean, 50 cents a dollar off. I mean, they weren't, we weren't talking, you know, 10, 15 dollars off. They were just a little bit off. So I think we'll be able to, to accommodate them without harming them. And at the same time, I think it may actually benefit our current existing employees. So is the plan now to elevate Cherokee Nation's pay to be comparable to that, the that's what we pay? That's what we think is going to happen, but we're still waiting on this MAG report from HR to because they've had this consulting group that's supposed to have come in, and I know they have, to evaluate all of the salaries to tell us that were underpaid, and last I heard that we were underpaid, but I haven't seen anything on paper or, num or real numbers. I don't know if you've seen it yet. It's supposed to be available in June, but they're supposed to do the market analysis on that, and we think, for example, housekeeping, we think we're low on because we have such a turnover rate in our housekeeping, and we're thinking it's probably going to bear that out once we receive the report. Then I still have uh, another question. On, uh, I don't know if all the council received this. Uh, there appears to be a concern that when, if this happens, if this transition happens, that Hastings will become, uh, the clinic will become an appointment only situation like our other clinics. Can you all address that question? I can. I, I think, I mean, there's two different things at Hastings. Hastings, one, is very different from our clinics because it's a hospital and it has an emergency room and then it also has an urgent care clinic that's, that's separate. And so the intent is, of course, we're going to keep the emergency room open. Right now, I, I've talked to Dr. Nolan, who is actually over their, over their urgent care walk-in, and we've talked about how we want that to function and potentially expanding the hours of that um, to help accommodate because he's looked at <coughs> times when it's when the ER is still very overcrowded and is there a way we could expand some of those services so so I guess to answer your question yes we're still going to have walk-ins available ideally of course we want everybody to get a primary care provider and have a physician they can go to all the time but until that day comes there is going to be walk-in and the walk-in will be comparable to what they have now yeah, with the only difference of our hope is to expand it. It's to expand the hours of it. Increase it rather than decrease right. it. Right, right. Yeah. Just one other question. Mm -hmm. The hundred, and this is back to the 183 employees. Mm -hmm. Will they be brought over on seniority status comparable to the seniority status that they have with the government right now? Yes, that's something that we have that we have recommended to the human resource um, team department is that we would prefer that they come in at the same seniority. So if they've been at Hastings for five years, then they would come over <coughs> and be recognized as being a Cherokee Nation employee for five years. So that would make a difference on their vacation time. It would make a little bit of difference on you know your 401k. So that's what we're 
and your sick leave. So, I mean, I guess not your sick leave, but that's what we want them to do is to come over. They will be asked to go on probation, any probationary period then? No, not as a general rule. Um, there are, we are having those identified that are below satisfactory status on evaluations, mm -hmm. and those would be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. They have, they have, I believe, 20, how many temporaries? 22 that had unsatisfactory evaluations? Uh, 21. 21. With 19 of those yeah. 21 employees that are, that are temporary part-time that had minimal, minimally successful, which under the IHS system basically means unsuccessful. And those people, even if they, and that's going to affect the regular full-time employees too because if you had a minimally successful evaluation, you're not eligible for an IPA under IHS's rules. So they won't let you IPA somebody who they don't feel like has been successful in their job duties. So what we'll have to do is look at all those people on a case-by-case -case basis and see if we want them to come over with a probationary period. Um, and in fairness to some of those employees, if you look at them, I mean, we've, we've had the opportunity to look at some of these employees. There are some categories of employees which it, they were under a new evaluation system this year, brand new. So, and then there were some employees that had brand new supervisors who were using a brand new evaluation system who had had 15 years of good evaluations. So I'm not sure, and I, I don't know them well enough to know, but I'm not sure just looking at paper, it looks like that it was a system failure, not not the employee. You know what I mean? I think they're probably really good employees, and somehow the system just kind of went went awry. So, so we'll look at it individually. So, some of the 21, some of them have been there as long as 15 years, and we're talking about they've years. got some of them that have been there 17 years. And see, I see that as a big problem. If they've been there that long, why would they have to serve another probationary period with us? Well, there's two things wrong with that, Tina, in, in my opinion. And we're trying to rectify this with IHS. One, if they've been a federal employee for 17 years, they're close to three more years and they'll be eligible for federal retirement. So we've been working with Ed because we would like those people, if there's a way that he can because he still has to advertise a position competitively and then select and then go through all that HR stuff and then somehow get them selected because we would like them to retain federal employment. Because, I, I mean, it's not, one, I don't think it's been fair. If I've worked there for 17 years, even though I've been, quote, unquote, a temporary employee, three more years and I can retire. So I think that's one issue. The second issue is if they've been there, that's where it comes into the case by case. If they've been there 17 years, they've had 16 years of perfect evaluation, and here's year 17, and somebody, they got a new evaluation tool, and then they've got a new supervisor who didn't know how to use it, then I think it's, it's within our discretion to say, come on over, you're just, you're an employee. And I think we're going to use that discretion. Because I don't want to see happen what happened to the housing authority, because Melanie, you signed an MOA on the housing authority, and then you put 130 some people on probation in violation of that MOA. And you know the MOA I'm talking about. Right. And we also expanded other areas of the of the MOA beyond, such as sick leave, beyond what was. We don't in the care MOA. about the expansion, but we should have at least adhere to the minimum of what that MOA required for those employees. So I don't want to see that happen here. Well, what is currently planned and the way we've done all of our planning is no across the board um, probationary period or introductory period at all. Only for those, we would only consider those that are currently not satisfactory at this point. But I'm assuming from what you're saying, Gloria, that if they had good evaluations up to a certain point, that's going right. to be taken into consideration. Right. I, I mean, I, I think we want to be, or I want, I mean, we want to be, Melanie does too, I mean, we want to be fair about it. And I think that, that you know, getting input from Ed, and, I mean, because they know them, they know the staff much better than we are. I think getting input from, from the people who are there will help us, because I think there are some people who just need to come over. Councillor Hoskins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
With respect to those employees who will remain federal employees, there's a large number of those that will remain federal employees. That's correct. But is it That's roughly 600? Right. That mm, is less than that. It'll be less than that. Yeah, it'll be about 450. As, as to those employees, um, as far as a day-to-day -day human resources function, I mean, are they federal employees, but they're supervised by? Supervised by the nation. And federal employees have certain uh, protections and uh, due process rights, even in some cases collective bargaining rights that might not be analogous to those in Cherokee Nation. So how would we reconcile that, and has there been any uh, has, is, has a time come to reconcile those in your negotiation? Uh, specifically, they won't have any uh, collective bargaining rights as it goes to the nation. Um, and in terms of, uh, say, disciplinary kinds of procedures, we would follow our procedures, but in terms of action that's taken on that federal employee, as you know, there's still a federal employee, so those actions don't necessarily translate into a direct action against that employee. In other words, an offense that would translate to a suspension on our side of the house wouldn't mean that that employee would get suspended because it's a, that's a federal employee. But what it does is build a record in that when that two years arises to renew that IPA or MOA agreement, then the nation can take that into consideration at that time as to whether to renew that agreement. <coughs> They won't have collective bargaining rights when the transition. Did they have collective bargaining rights before? Yes. They have a union right now. And, and if you look at, there's some case law that talks about unions and when tribes, when tribes assume. And the only collective bargaining right they have are in regards to things that they can bargain with the federal government about, which would be they could have collective bargaining rights in regards to their pay, their leave, um, holidays, but they lose the collective bargaining power for things that are local that the federal government no longer has control over, which is more of their job duties, their work side, their working conditions, those things have, have been, are no longer um, available. So their union will remain in place, but the limits to their negotiating power will be those uh, major wage type working with, IH, with, with the IHS. federal government, yes. They'll have no bargaining power within the Cherokee Nation. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. And we have a, there's a really good case law, and I just don't have it, that, that goes through all of that, <coughs> that we might, that can explain it far better than I've explained it. Yeah, if you send that next time. Maybe. Yeah, we'll send that to you. Yes. Councilor Buzzard. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Uh, and one to follow up on Councilor Hoskins. And, and I think this has to do with hol holiday pay or holiday leave. You're looking at 450 employees there. And is that going to be negotiated down that they observe the Cherokee Nation holidays and not federal holidays? With under federal under an IPA, they they have to get as part of their job. They have to get the federal holidays. But you're talking about 400 and some people. And we can and you know we can have them work. Um, we can have we can put them have them off on the days that are are our holidays, um, and so let's say Martin Luther King Day, which is not one of our holidays, by law they have to have eight hours of holiday pay. So we can either choose for them to work that day, or if they don't work, they get eight hours. If they do work, they get eight hours holiday pay plus eight hours overtime. Um, so we're going to have to work out, and the good thing is it's a hospital, so I mean there are going to be a lot of holidays that, that people will be working anyway, but we'll have to actually sit down and, and figure that out because we get two more holidays than they get, and they get two, they get ten holidays, but two of those are holidays we don't reserve. So we'll have to actually, you know, sit down. Some, some places will be easy if it's hot, people who are actually working in the hospital versus more administrative, non-hospital well, I just saw the problem with some people want to take off the same day, and I'm sure it's No, they out. won't. I mean, because it's like it is now. I mean, they just schedule. Uh, the other question I had, uh, Melody, is uh, how many people at Hastings have, or are we offered a buyout program? Is the IHS offering a buyout? 
program for them to leave? Buyout program? Uh, no, but um, any of those that are eligible for retirement, mm -hmm. um, as you know, you don't have to, it's a combination, I think, of tenure as well as, um, what else? Yeah, there, there's, there's a combination, anyway, there's formulas and you can get out with less than 100% of your retirement vested. So is there any that, that's going to fall in that category? Yes, and so employees would have the option to go ahead and retire and then come on as a tribal hire and collect both. Actually. And those buyout dollars would not, not come from the, the takeover, it would come from some of no, the... No, um, actually it just comes from IHS and it comes from their budget. So it's um, Right. Okay, thank you. And, and Harley, there's two, there's two different things. There's people who are going to retire and then there's also, you can do it and you can get a... A severance package. Severance. So even if you've been there, say just five years, okay, so you, you, you can you can both. still you can still get a severance package and just, convert. Yeah, you could just get the severance and then come on as a tribal hire. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Council Crittenden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Melanie, I guess as a federal retired person, uh, work, if I was working in a situation like we have here, anticipating all of this change. I think I might have might have some reservations about supervision and the workplace environment. You know the changes that might take place there. Um, have you seen any uh, movement toward people uh, transferring out, uh, as anticipating some of the problems that might be going to happen here, or do you anticipate anything like that? The, the end result is I think our customers or our people that come to that for services. And how would that be? Is anybody looking at how that might affect that in the long run? That's, uh, that's been a huge concern of ours because obviously we need every employee that's there. It's hard to recruit um, different professions and uh, we need those employees to stay there. And uh, Melissa and Gloria have spent a lot of time um, actually have an office in the building um, to be able to answer questions as staff have ideas, concerns questions they can come just drop by there and talk with Melissa and Gloria and I think that's been very helpful um, one question that came up and I just wanted to answer it you know more definitively is this question of uh, health professionals and was were there any leaving as a result of hearing about this or being concerned about this and so we asked um, specifically for that information about the last couple three months how many docs have, have departed um, and what were the reasons for them leaving? And so we got a response to that. The other <coughs> and day. we did. We got a response, and, and the response we get, and I don't, I hope it's all truthful. Nobody's just saying it to be nice, is it? <laughs> that nobody has left because of this. Um, we had Dr. Cheek leaving, who was already planning on leaving, and she went to Claremore. She's one of their new people. Um, we had a physician who was an emergency room physician who was very good, who's making, I don't know, 60 or 80,000 more. A year to be in Tulsa, and, that, and that's where he's closer to his home. Um, they had one person that went up to Alaska, and I think that was something that had already had already been planned. So, from what we're hearing, is that nobody has left because of, these were things were already already in the already in the works um, to happen. So, uh, uh, Councilmember Crittenden, I might add that. Even in the context of this discussion about transitioning, we've had folks, uh, medical <coughs> providers, who've actually left and come back during the discussion of this transition. That is, has not been a factor in all of this. We understand that the supervisory structure will remain in place. Hastings is not going to be dismantled, reorganized, at least immediately, when the transition occurs, you'll s the same bright faces will be there. Supervisor, employee, uh, management, all of us have committed to making this a success. These issues that appear to be being discussed out among the folks who may not see this as an advantage to the Cherokee Nation as an exercise of sovereignty 
may be seeing those kinds of things, but we in management, we in the supervisory structure at Hastings are not seeing that. We typically see a churning, as I mentioned a minute ago, to a question, I believe, by uh, Mr. Uh, Councilmember Buzzard a minute ago. There's always vacancies occurring. We have about a 10 to 12 percent vacancy rate among all of the departments at any given time. We're not seeing any more of that than is usually the case. It's just not a factor. I think people are seeing the advantages of transitioning into this system. Uh, one more comment. And, mm -hmm. and I, hope, I certainly hope that pans out to be true. Mm -hmm. But there is that concern out there yep. in, with me also. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have another comment from Madam Speaker Fraley. Either one of you. There, there were some doctors that left. I think you mentioned three or four that have left. Mm -hmm. Have those been replaced? And if not, what is the plan to replace them, or are you going? To Th those have not been replaced, and this has put us in a, a difficult situation in the sense of right now, because they're still IHS. We're still relying on the area office who does their recruiting and advertising to get those done. Um, I hate that I'm on TV. There seems to be a little bit of dragging of feet. Okay, politically correct. It doesn't seem to be happening at the pace that we would like it to happen to. I don't anticipate that those things are going to happen until there is a decision made for Cherokee Nation to, to take over and us to do it. I just don't think it's I think it's become a lower priority from a from an area level. Um, so we at Cherokee Nation are, you know, I, I met with the person that's doing our recruiting, and we are asked that these are the positions that are vacant at Hastings, and these are things that we need to put on our radar screen to start <coughs> recruiting for. Mm -hmm. And and even, you know, at this point, we're going to start actively recruiting for all vacancies. And that was as politically correct as I could be. So <laughs> so yes, we, they are going to be re replaced. Typically, typically, how long does it take to replace the physician's position? Um, I know it's slimy, they just go through them like you quickly. Know, it, it depends. It depends on what the, what the specialty is, and um, it depends on the time of the year. I mean, right now, it's when people, this is kind of high recruitment season, people mm -hmm. are finishing up their residencies. People will be looking for jobs in July and August. So we're at high recruitment season, and this is a good time to try to be filling positions. So typically? So typically, um, I mean, it just varies. Sometimes we can get people, you know, in a few weeks, and sometimes it takes, you know, months. Mm -hmm. So it just varies. We, we did recruit a surgeon for Hastings, um, and that was somebody that came very quickly and very easily because uh, his wife works for us and she said my husband's getting ready to be done he wants to come work and it was a very easy recruit um, so we get fortunate like that at times at other times you know at Salisaw we've, we've been struggling and uh, uh, I think we about have Dr. Nowlin signed and ready to go so um, he called he called I thought he was going to no, he called. No, at this point, he called HR this week to talk about 401k and 457. So, okay. so I think he's about ready to sign on the dotted line. So it's been. A, don't don't tell me anything bad. It takes IHS. I mean, IHS. They've had vacancies. They've had their radiology position open for as long as I know. Probably 10 years. 10 years. I mean, they've had a position vacant for 10 years. So you believe that if Cherokee Nation were administering this, that we could recruit <coughs> and secure good quality positions in a more timely manner? Yes, I do. Manner. I do. I because? I think that we can, one, we can offer, one of the problems they have with, they can't offer somebody that's a resident a job. They have to wait until they, so they're completely done. Um, they go through the process of getting their, of their, uh, passing all their boards. We can 
when they're still in the resident, you know, do a letter of intent that says once upon satisfaction completion of your residency, you'll have a job at Cherokee Nation starting this time, making this much money. So they lose a lot that way. The other thing that they don't have control over is they have no local recruiting. They rely on area office to do their recruiting. And not to speak for Ed, but I think it's been a say the words. <laughs> you say the words. I've said enough. Uh, well, <laughs> we've uh, had uh, we've had a considerable amount of uh, concern about our ability to work with our recruiting uh, service out of Oklahoma City. And uh, matter of fact, we've uh, actually had some discussions with the Cherokee Nation to see if we could get some assistance from them locally to help us with the staffing in that area. So it, it's been uh, fairly challenging, I would say, in working with the area office and uh, getting the recruitments done for physicians. Thank you. <coughs> Council Jordan. You know, my, my constituents somewhat operate on rumor because that's all they have to go by. And one of the rumors is, and it concerns doctors, is that we're going to be losing a large percentage of the uh, children's doctors uh, because of some sort of difference in the licensing process. But, okay, that's a really, uh, that's, a, that's a legitimate, very legitimate concern. And we have met with, they have five full-time pediatricians at Hastings right now. Um, Dr. Lewis, who anybody from around here knows, been here forever, been here forever. great guy, um, is the chair of that department. Um, they have some physicians there who have only Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico license. Um, one of the things that happens with, with the tribe operating is that we require people to have an Oklahoma license. And it's not just because, it's because we have to have it to bill. We have different billing requirements on being able to bill for services than IHS does. And so we need people to have an Oklahoma <coughs> license. Um, I met with, you know, Dr. Nolan had, had brought this to my attention, and so we met with the five pediatricians on <coughs> Friday. Friday. On Friday, we met with the five pediatricians on Friday and sat down with them to talk about their concerns. Um, tried to really reiterate that the licensing issue is something that one, we help them with, we'll help them through the process, we'll help them pay for the process, and we give them plenty of time. I mean, sometimes it takes two years to get an Oklahoma license, and it's, it's through no fault of their own. It's just, that's just how our licensing board is. It's very strict and it's very um, difficult. Um, sometimes we can ha it happens a little bit quicker because we've gotten people who we've been allowed to get Oklahoma license but only allow them to practice at Cherokee Nation because they don't want to increase the competition in Oklahoma, which that's a whole other story. We don't have enough doctors anyway. but um, so, so we've alleviated, I think, their concern. And, and Doug, I mean, you talked to them. Have you talked to them since the meeting we had on Friday? Actually, we received some... Uh uh, they were very pleased with me. They had some legitimate concerns, and I think it comforted them to sit down with uh, Dr. Graham and Melissa Gower. Uh, they had those concerns addressed. The words they used was they, they felt the Cherokee Nation was being sincere and honest and did um, and were concerned about keeping them as physicians. And so we're still discussing them, but I think that they feel much better about the process. And so, I mean, so Tina, that, that's the thing, and I think I've told you this before. I mean, when people hear rumors, one, we want to know them because we want a chance to, I mean, that was a very good example. I mean, we needed a chance to go sit down with those five pediatricians and say, what are your concerns? How can we alleviate your concern? Because we want you to stay. I mean, we can't replace five pediatricians. It's just not going to happen. And they're good pediatricians. I mean, we don't want to replace them. They're very good pediatricians. So I think that helped, and I think we're going to try to do that with lots of with smaller groups, just start meeting with smaller groups, and because everybody has a different concern, it seems. Well, I, I get a lot of rumors at home as well as you. But I'm the last one to hear them. Nobody <laughs> tells me the rumors. Okay, <laughs> okay. nobody <laughs> tells me. Okay, Councilor Fulbright. My concern is this is for Dr. Graham. An organization as large as ours. Do we have a full-time recruiter, or do we just recruit 
we this has been the problem. We haven't we have worked with HR and relied on HR to do some of our recruiting and we've done some of it. The problem is when you're really recruiting for different you know, and I don't care if it's healthcare professionals or, or other things. I mean if you're recruiting for a dentist, they like to, to know and talk to somebody who understands the dental field. Um, and that hasn't always happened. So what we're doing in the 09 budget is we, we've actually <laughs> met with HR and we're going to change our recruitment process. We're going to have a full-time recruiter that is physically located in health. That's going to actually be a health employee. And then we're going to take that person and at times if we're going to a big dental place, we'll take, take Dr. Hacker with us. Or we'll, you know, so we'll have somebody to go with her, but she's going to be a full-time recruiter because she has to... There's so much follow-up and phone calls, and if you don't have somebody who just does that, you lose them. So we're changing that. I'm really glad to hear that because at Redbird, we have been so short-staffed for so long, and it's like Dr. Gann is trying to recruit somebody yes. on her own, doing yes. it you know, really hard, but I don't see, I just want us to have a full-time person recruiting, and I think that's a great idea. I hope it'll improve things for us. We are her. desperate. I mean, the doctors see somebody and they're sick and maybe it's just a walk-in. They can't even do a recheck in two yeah. or three weeks. I mean, they're, they're booked. If you call up there today and want an appointment, you may get one in three to four or five months. Yeah, and I was hoping Dr. Nolan was going to fill that gap. <laughs> Dr. Maybe Allen. we will. Maybe I was misinformed. But I had been told that one of the people on the hospital board said he had decided to go to William Memorial Hospital. I know he had negotiated with him, but maybe. So we met with him last week and then he called. Okay. It must have been it's yesterday good. about the 401k stuff. No, this so. is three or four weeks ago. Okay. I hope you're right. Do we have any more questions specifically about IHS negotiations? I do have a comment. Is the committee you suggested with the chair of ENF, is that something you needed to set up together or is it something we need to do here? Either, whatever the pleasure of the committee is. I would suggest um, that the chair of ENF, you just get together and set that up and okay. solve that problem. Okay. Now, since Councilor Soap is younger than I am, he can probably actually remember what his question <laughs> about the Cherokee National Health Report was. Next, I've got a, 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 just a general comment and a couple of questions about the, uh, the, the report and some of the things that I've heard. Uh, uh, Dr. Graff, you just let Melissa Gower know that uh, I appreciate um, uh, Mr. Uh, Smith over to Almost Lana Community Clinic. Uh, we recently had some uh, community meetings, mm -hmm. and uh, he was in attendance. Good. And I think that's great that the uh, director, you know, gets out and uh, gets out in the community. It's one thing just to have an open door policy, but it's another thing to actually get out and engage, you know, people to where they feel comfortable. They don't always feel comfortable in, you know, in an office setting or in, yeah. you know, the, the director's office, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, that was uh, very pleasing to me to see, uh, you know, the Cherokee Nation represented in that manner. And I think there was a lot of good feedback provided uh, to uh, Mr. Smith. The other thing is, uh, you know, um, Ed mentioned uh, about the bright faces. And uh, that was one of the things that uh, was reoccurring in the uh, comments from the community was that, uh, you know, the customer service aspect is one thing to go in and get, you know, a service performed um, you know, on your body or, or, or medicine or whatnot, but some of the uh, customer relations Issues. And I was just curious as to what type of training uh, does the nation offer its uh, employees at the, at the clinic level uh, in regards to those types of interactions with, with the uh, clients? Well, yeah, we, we have some, part of them are just the, the trainings that occur Cherokee Nationwide, which are, um, you know, customer satisfaction, and those are very generic customer satisfaction trainings right. and, and uh, telephone trainings and just how to be courteous. Then at a clinic level, one of the things that we've started with our IHI initiative is that we've really worked on promoting customer satisfaction and providing some trainings at that level based on customer feedback we get. And, and I don't know if, if you've noticed at Salon, but we're doing, um, we're doing customer satisfaction surveys much more frequently than we used right. to. Right. That's the other question was, is what's the, is the report that come out from, uh, in your, the report that you've mentioned that uh, you've got this, you know, current key survey, hardware, software, that uh, these surveys are coming out, and uh, what, what is the, you know, the message that the, that the directors are getting 
uh, and the feedback from these surveys? They get, you know, with the, with the turnkey, we, one, we still design the questions and we can alter the questions. We try to keep them fairly similar from year to year so that we can, because we have a statistician who says, you know, they've got to be similar. We can't compare them and yada, yada, yada. And we can't change a word in them. But um, so we, when we do that, we get, a, we get a score. And then there's also, from the survey, it gives us a little bit of um, just qualitative information of how the computer, you know, evaluated this. We take that internally then as a, as a quality improvement team and say, Here's the areas that we're weakened with the director. Here's the areas that we that we were weakened at this particular facility. We need you to get with your staff and work on a plan to help resolve these problems that customers aren't happy, that patients aren't happy with. And so then he sits down with his team in Salina and goes through some of those some of those issues. Sometimes it's things like um, things that he can't handle. Look, maybe it's a telephone system or something. You know, and he says, you know, this I need help. But if it's things locally. Um, people aren't answering the phone, they get a machine. I mean, it's things like that that he can go back to his team and say, how are we going to resolve this? Okay. And so he gets a lot, he and his team at Salina would have the input on that. Thank you. You're welcome. Council Buzzard. Yes, Laura, just to follow up on what the council Health was talking about, is there, a, is there a common section on that survey form that's, that's in those clinics? I looked at one, it seemed like there's only like four questions or three questions that are on there. No, there's a lot of questions. We have different, and it depend, depends on which survey you use. Sometimes we bring it in for, we have a quality of care survey, and then we have more of a, just a customer service survey. Oh, so, the, so you do change? We, we do, and then sometimes we bring it in just to a department even. So we may just want to evaluate the WIC departments at all of the clinics. It's real easy. We just change the computer questions, and so we can change the surveys to fit whatever given situation we're trying to evaluate. Okay. The other thing is uh, on recruiting, this is just a comment. Uh -huh. I know it's not uh, your particular department, but it sounds like you're going to get more into it. But the comment I have made is, is a lot of times we recruit the people at the clinics, Church Nation clinics. By the time they notify those people to come to work, they've already found another job because they waited six or eight weeks. So that's a problem. That, that's a problem. And that's one of the things when we met with, with Human Resources about because the way they had been doing it, they have two people over there that basically are supposed to spend half their time recruiting for health and half their time processing the paperwork when we hire somebody. And especially, you know, having had Muskogee come on, what we explained to him is we, we would prefer to hire the, the people to recruit and take that job on internally because we really need them to process the paperwork because we don't know how to do that. And so that so we've agreed, so Michael Patel has agreed that yes, those two people will do do the paperwork process and get people actually hired and we'll do the recruiting. And the other thing that I'd, I'd like to request, and, and I hope you can do this, is I'd like to see, or I'd like to see the third party collection from our clinics. Okay. Can you, can you break those out by clinic? Yep. And, and I guess, uh, I don't know, I think that Hastings has done such a wonderful job on third party, and I hope we're doing the same. And we, and we are, and it may be, and we get, you know. I know break them down, but I don't want yeah, I think what we've done is we've consolidated okay. into this big right. overall, but we can break them down uh, by clinic because we, we do that. I mean, because okay. I get a report that says by clinic, so we can just start including that with yours. Councilor Baker. Yeah, uh, on the, the negotiations in Hastings, I've, I've got some observations. The uh, it is extremely frustrating. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I, I don't think, I mean, Dr. Cobwood and Jack, uh, that how difficult it, it really is for Melissa and Melanie and, and, uh, and Gloria because they'll, they'll ask a pertinent question and they'll give them a timeline when they'll answer it. And it's always next week. Or it's, and, and they've been asking these questions for six months uh, with virtually no true hard fast uh, answer and uh, uh, so the I'm not I mean I'm not sure that you're only down to four critical ones but uh, but they did bring in a couple of experts which I was very impressed with uh, one from a law firm in DC that had negotiated 
in the past, and I, and I feel confident that she brought to the table some answers to questions that we hadn't asked yet. That uh, that she was able to say, "Hey, you need to ask about this. You need to ask about that." Mm -hmm. That I had we not had her, we would just left that money on the table. Absolutely, 100%. I we would not have asked. We would have not have gotten it. And it's almost like it's a them against us situation. And anything we forget to ask about is more that they'll have in area office. Yes. It is is the, the the feeling that I'm getting. And uh, uh, and if we can't get information in a timely fashion, I mean, I honestly don't see how it's going to going to meet the timelines. And uh, if they don't stonewall much more, and maybe the letter uh, to uh, to uh, uh, Rock Rockville will help, but. Uh, but this is not an easy process, and my hat's off to those folks. I mean, I've sat there and tried to keep my mouth shut. And, uh, but uh, uh, it is extremely tedious, and, uh, uh, and it's, a, it's a major undertaking that could be the most important thing this, this council decides on uh, in this term or, or the next tier three, because the, the number one service that the people rely on, uh, especially the poor, is the health care and Hastings and, and, and all. So we, you know, we can't take it lightly, and uh, Doug got also set in on it. But, uh, uh, but the, this is critical and, and really a hard, a hard job. And, uh, but uh, anyway, that, that's just my comments. Councillor Fulbright. I just got a short comment. Recently, Councillor Thornton and I had a community meeting at Mulgrove, and the assistant administrator at Redbird came. She did a wonderful job, and we had a large crowd there, and she cleared up so many issues and answered so many questions from the floor. And I, it was just really educational for everybody. We need to have one in every little community. But she really did a good job. She's good. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda is old business. There appears to be none. New business, um, I believe that we passed that at council last night, so that is a that is not an agenda item. I don't believe there's anything else I need to do about that, but if there is somebody inform me. <laughs> Um, announcements. Our next meeting is tentatively scheduled for June 17th at 10 a.m. Are there any other announcements? I will accept a motion for adjournment. Second. First and second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you.